Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your word, which you watch over to perform. We thank you for your promise that your word will not return to you void and empty, that it will indeed accomplish the purposes for which you send it. Holy Spirit, we pray that you make it so among us today. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. powerful and if you want to make me well make me clean And that was the scene that confronted Jesus as he stepped out in the city one day. Must have been a desperate man, a very sick man. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, I continue to encourage you to bring your Bibles, because if you're bringing your Bibles and you're opening them here, chances are great you open them at home. But if you didn't bring one, it's all right, there are a few Bibles, Luke chapter 5. Luke is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Does everybody, anybody have a page number? 1598. Luke chapter 5. So far we have been talking about Jesus, the life of Jesus, setting the scene now. When Jesus finally begins his work, we remember he goes to his hometown in Nazareth. And at Nazareth, they give him the scroll and he takes it and he reads it. And remember what he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to declare good news to the poor. Eyesight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, to set the captives free and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. That's the mission of Jesus. Well, he has called four disciples now, if you remember, he's called four, he's called uh, Peter, he's called Andrew, he's called James and John, the sons of Zebedee. That was at the end of chapter 4. And now, finally, Jesus is moving into his ministry. Let's read together what happens when a desperate man approaches him in the city. And how Jesus responds. Luke Chapter 5. We are in verse 12. Once, when Jesus was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed to his face 
to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And Jesus ordered him to tell no one, go, he said, and show yourself to the priest. And as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing, for a testimony to them. But now, when every word, when everyone heard about Jesus spread abroad, many crowd would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he, Jesus, would withdraw to a deserted place and pray. The word of the Lord. been thinking about this text now for a little while and today I want to I want to just remind us of our mission statement which is to love God know Christ care for one another and joyfully share the good news of Jesus Christ and that joyfully share the good news of Jesus Christ says out loud that we are a people who want to join with Jesus in his mission right we say we want to join with Jesus in his mission and in order to participate in that mission, this text gives us a few things to think about. Gives us a few things that we ought to be willing to do in order to live out this mission of, of joyfully sharing the good news, of, of participating with Jesus. Now, Jesus has called four disciples I don't imagine there's a, a large crowd behind him now, and he is in a city. So the first thing that we ought to be willing to do, I'm calling these the, the things that we ought to be willing to do in order to join Jesus in his mission, if you follow along on your handout. We ought to be willing, first and foremost, it's so obvious I almost missed it. We ought to be willing to go. We ought to be willing to go. Jesus is going somewhere. He's going somewhere. He's putting foot in front of foot. He's literally moving from place to place. Remember when he first preached in his hometown at Nazareth? What did the people say? To begin with, they said, now this is wonderful. Our homeboy has come home and he's got the power to perform miracles. Why don't you begin here? Right. Start here and let's get some things done here. I tell you what, let the rest of the world wait. And they can come to us if they want. They have to come all the way up the hill to Nazareth if they want. We want you here, remember? And Jesus went ahead and said a few more things to them. They didn't like it. And the next thing you knew, they had grabbed him and they were ready to what? Throw him off the cliff. I hope you remember that story. Luke chapter 4. So this Jesus we are meeting is always moving. He's willing to go. Where is he going? Where is he going? Well, what does the mission say? The mission says he's come to proclaim good news to the poor. So he will go to where the poor are. Poor in spirit, not just money. Poor in relationships, poor in freedom. He will go where the poor are. He also says, I have come to declare freedom to the captives. Oh my goodness. Where are the places where we find ourselves bound and held captive? Addictions, shall we say? Habits, shall we say? Certain relationships, whatever it is that is holding us captive, the gospel is about freedom. Jesus says, I'm going to the place where the captives are. I'm going to the place where the captives are. Willing to go, that's the first thing. We have to be willing to go. Now, it is not the nature of the church to be willing to go. The New Testament church of the Holy Spirit, after the Holy Spirit came, chose to stay. And they stayed and enjoyed the fellowship. Oh, it was sweet. 
They sang songs, they had communion, they had prayer services, they just stayed put. It was awesome until Stephen was killed. Persecution broke open and it was that which drove the church out. And they took the gospel with them. It is not in our nature to want to go. We would rather stay. But Jesus is going. We've got to be willing to go. That's the first thing. The second thing also in verse 12, this is not something that Jesus do. This is something that the desperate man does. What does he do? He is willing, the leper is willing to do what? He's willing to come to Jesus, isn't he? He is willing to come to Jesus in his desperation. And when he comes to Jesus, listen to what he says. He doesn't say that I have heard that you are powerful. Please make me well. That's not what he says. He says that if you will, please cleanse me. Now, cleansing is not the same as healing. The Greek is very clear. It's a very different word between cleansing and healing. Why? All the Testaments say, they use this word, cleanse me. Why? Rather than heal me. See, Luke is careful. Luke is a doctor, as you remember. And Luke is careful to let us know that the man was covered with leprosy. He didn't just get sick last night. He is covered with leprosy. Now, maybe it wasn't leprosy. Maybe it was a skin disease of some kind translated into leprosy for our benefit. But the picture is clear. Whatever he had, it was all over. And when you were in such a condition in his time, in the days of Jesus, you weren't just sick, you were thrown out. You were considered unclean. You are not welcome to live in community with your own family. You are not welcome in the temple for worship. You didn't go to a synagogue. You were thrown out. And if there were any family members who thought about you often enough, they could come, look left and right, and they could leave some food out there somewhere where they think you might be to go get. You had no human contact. That's what it meant to be unclean. So when he comes to Jesus, he says, if you're willing, make me clean. He's asking for a lot more than just get rid of my leprosy, is he not? Desperate. Desperate. I just wonder, I wonder if, if, if in our lives there are places of desperation. Things we've struggled with and worked on and, 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 and swore up and down and just will not break loose. We are held captive. The gospel is about freedom. And that's what Jesus is about. So our second willingness is the willingness, like the leper, to come to Jesus in our desperation. A willingness to come in our desperation. Third willingness as we continue on. Oh my goodness. The passage is very clear that this man comes close enough to Jesus, but there's something he doesn't do. You notice, he comes close enough. People are parting as he comes through because you don't want to touch him. The man is unclean. But he comes close enough. He bows now before Jesus' face on the ground, but he does not touch Jesus. Why? Because an unclean person touching a clean person makes a clean person unclean. That's how it works. That's why you keep your distance. And you carry a bell around your, 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 uh, your midsection. So the bell... Jingles when people hear you're coming and they, they get out of the way. So he's close enough to Jesus, but he doesn't touch Jesus. Jesus could have healed him with a word. He could have healed him with a word. He does it. Sometimes he heals from a distance. 
Somebody in another town, he says, your daughter will be well, and it happens. Why does Jesus stretch out his hand and what? And touch him. Why? There's a message there, I think. There's a message there. There's a message there in that touch. Luke doesn't tell us why, but Mark does. So I looked up Mark. Mark, telling the same story. Why does Jesus touch him? Mark says, Jesus moved with pity, stretched out his hand and touched the man and healed him. Pity, well, I don't know how I feel about pity. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about pity. So I looked up the Greek. The root word of pity, guess what it is? It's not compassion. It's anger. Anger. Jesus is ticked off. He's looking at this man in front of him, held hostage and bound by this disease and the entire system that has thrown him out, and Jesus is ticked off. And so while he could have healed him with just a word, he decides to push the system. <laughs> and intentionally reaches out his hand and touches him. He is willing to be deeply moved by somebody else's situation. Deeply moved by somebody else's situation. Oh, there was a terrible fire in that house and we hear about it and oh my gosh. That's just too bad. That really is too bad. And that's about the extent of it. Deeply moved. Deeply moved. Got to be willing to be deeply moved. So Jesus is willing to go, number one. Got to be willing to go. Number two, the desperate man is willing to come to Jesus. Got to be willing to come to Jesus without desperation. Number three, willing to be moved by the plight of others. Now, this leper, Jesus tells, don't say a word to a soul. <laughs> Says right there, don't say a word to a soul. And apparently, he didn't listen. Jesus did not suggest to him, don't say a word to a soul. It says he was ordered, he was commanded very clearly, don't say a word to a soul. What he ought to do is go up the hill to the home of the priest, and when you get there, present yourself to the priest. And the priest will begin all the inspections and different tests and offerings and sacrifices that take probably 7 to 21 days. It's a long process for a person who has been cast out to be restored. And people gather and watch this, and they are wondering, is he going to make it or not? I mean, it's a long process. He is supposed to go and begin this process so that he can be fully and completely restored to the community. He does that. We know he does that. He has to do that to be received back. But on the way, he shares the good news. <laughs> He, he, he can hold his joy and he shares with other people and the crowd comes and they come and they come and they come so much so that Jesus can no longer go into the city. Now he's on the outskirts. Very interesting. It seems as though Jesus has traded places with this leper. He used to be cast out of the city. Now Jesus can't go into the city. Now he's on the outside. That's interesting to think about, but don't get lost there. Our fourth willingness, and we're done. Notice what Jesus does. When the crowd comes and presses in, from time to time it says, he was willing to withdraw for prayer in solitude. And that's interesting. 
I mean, the Son of God did not hang out there and make sure that everybody was fed, and every leper was healed, and every meeting was attended to. You mean that when it was time for prayer that he uh, uh, disconnected and went to pray in solitude? Is that actually even allowed? Not only is it allowed, it is commanded. It's called the Sabbath. <laughs> Unplug, trust God. This is not about you. Jesus is willing to say, that's it. It's time. It's time. And he pulls away into a deserted place. That's a place of solitude. And he prays. If we are going to be a people who join with Jesus and his mission, we've got to be willing to unplug and to pull away and to recover and recharge in prayer. Because prayer is not just one thing that ought to be on the list that is checked. It is the thing that fuels everything else. You leave that out, everything else is just busy. <laughs> We're reading a book in our study called Unbinding the Gospel. <laughs> and there's a phrase in there, Jeff, which we read last week, which says that when we forget about prayer, much of church becomes work, work, and more work. Does that sound familiar? And you get tired and worn out, forgetting to unplug, disengage. When Martin Luther died, that great reformer, somebody found a note next to his deathbed. And the note was written both in Latin and in German, and this is what it said. It is at the bottom of your outline. We are all beggars. This is true. We are all beggars. This is true. See, this mindset that as a believer, we all stand in the bread line. Everybody's in the bread line. <laughs> Someday you're giving out bread, other days you're receiving bread. But everybody is in the bread line. And we ought to know when to receive it and when to give it. But in humility and gentleness, we are all in the same bread line. Holy God, I don't know where everybody is today. But for those among us who have not yet in some way connected with you so that this makes some sense, we pray, O oh God, that by your spirit you will draw us to you into a primary relationship with you. For those that, Lord, are in relationship with you, but have gotten so busy, so tired, have forgotten about prayer. Father, we pray that you restore us. Help us to trust you enough to disengage, to meet you in private. And there to be energized again to meet you out there where you are in mission. We ask all this in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.